Hey, good morning, church. It's great to see you guys today. Do you have plans for the Super Bowl today? Anybody got some plans? Give special food. Some of you do. Watching the game, watching the commercials, eating good food, all of those things. I hope it's coming for you today. I know my, my wife was kind of, okay, you know, is there something special you want? I was like, yes. Homemade salsa, creamy jalapeno dip. How about some deer burgers? I mean, we're going to be ready. So <laughs> I'm excited for it. It's going to be a great evening uh, for sure. But it's even greater to be in the same room with you guys worshiping Jesus. Just being able to put focus on him on, on this day where our nation, and really actually the world, I don't know if you know this, it's one of the most televised things that happens on the face of the planet on Super Bowl Sunday, and there's going to be millions of people all around the world that are going to be shouting and yelling at TVs and, and in the stadium today, but you know, I thought, you know, um, Jesus, we get to shout to you too, right? That's, that's actually in the psalm. The psalmist says that part of our phrase is we are shout to the Lord, and so I was thinking about that. I was like, I wonder how many churches today in Ackworth, Georgia are actually going to shout, and so I said, well, if no one else will, we will, so Hey, would you guys just stand to your feet? Come on, 9.30. We're, we're, we're going to have a little fun today. I know it's a little rainy outside. I know we're all a little, you know, kind of saving our energy for a little bit later. Uh, but I just thought it'd be good if we actually did this biblical thing of shouting to God. So on the count of three, I just want you to let it rip with everything you've got. And I want you to think about this. Why would we shout to Jesus? Well, again, because the Bible says that we do that. But remember that Jesus says, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am also. Which means the same Jesus that went to the cross and has nails in his hands and his side was pierced for you and for me who overcame death and hell and has the keys of victory in his hands and wants to set you free today. He's here by the spirit of the living God. So on the count of three, let's just let him know how much we love him. One, two, three. Come on, church. We love you, God. We love you, Jesus. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on. You can have a seat. That's pretty good, 930. I'm proud of you. I like that. Y'all came ready to go. I appreciate that. Uh, well, now we can scream at the TV all we want because we gave Jesus some love first. Um, hey, one more thing just to know about some things going on around here. You would have seen an email, but just in case you missed it, you're beginning your tax returns, some of you, and maybe wanting to know where is my giving statement for the year if you're going to be itemizing your deductions. Um, we don't mail those out to everybody, but you can go to our database and download it as a PDF, and we sent out an email on January the 31st, and so if you would like to know how to do that, go back to your email check your junk mail. You'll find that email to give you all the instructions or you can call our office uh, this week and we will help you figure out how to get into our database if that's something that you need. Well, today we're starting a new sermon series called The Way of Wisdom. And I'm super pumped about this because we're going to be going into the book of Proverbs, uh, which is a book that was written mostly by King Solomon, who was the son of King David. There are some Proverbs that scholars believe are not necessarily uh, from him, but were just attributed to him. So in general, what we're going to be talking about is King Solomon. He was recognized as one of the wisest people that ever lived. And so whether he wrote these Psalms himself or whether he was responsible for just kind of like a good librarian, collecting all of this wisdom and then putting it in one book where we could have it. This is a special book that we have, full of wisdom for your life. And here's the beautiful thing about books of wisdom. You don't even have to believe in God for these principles to be effective in your life. Now, obviously, we would submit to you that one of the best ways to experience life is to follow God. But whether you're walking with Jesus or whether you're far from God, whether you're here to keep peace at home, and somebody said, if you don't go to church, I'm not cooking your favorite dip for the Super Bowl tonight. Whatever the, the thing is, actually, you don't cook dip. Whatever you cook, right? Uh, obviously, I'm not the one that's doing that today. Uh, uh, but whatever the, the thing is that brought you here, a hunger for God, or I was just bored and didn't have anything else to do, the good news is what I'm going to give you today can be applied to your life and bring blessing to your life. That's, that's the beautiful thing about the book of Proverbs. Here's just another just quick thing to know about this particular book. There's 31 chapters, and because many months, there's 31 days in a month, an easy Bible reading plan for you. If you're kind of new to the Bible or new to church, or how, how do I begin to know just some more things about God, is just wake up every day, look at the calendar. Okay, today's the 11th. I'm going to read the 11th chapter of Proverbs, and you could just kind of do that on a monthly basis, whatever the day of the calendar calendar is, read that particular proverb and, and ask God, say, Lord, would you just help me apply this to my life? And if you'll do that, I know that you're going to be blessed by it. But more than that, you're going to find the way of wisdom. 
Now, depending on your age, if, if you're my age, you'll remember this. If you're older, maybe not. And if you're younger, for sure not. Uh, in 1984, there was a movie called Karate Kid. And Karate Kid went crazy. I was a little kid when that movie came out. And they went on to make like six versions of this thing. I mean, it had like the one, two, and three, and then the remake, and then the, the sequel of the remake. I mean, it's just, and TV shows, like it became a, a cultural classic here in America. And if you remember kind of the story, if you've ever seen the movie, uh, you remember there was a guy named Daniel who wanted to learn karate. He was being bullied at school and, and getting picked on. And these other kids were part of this karate uh, and, uh, studio or whatever. And so he wanted to learn. So he found this guy, this older wise man named Mr. Miyagi. And he said, Mr. Miyagi, I want you to teach me karate. Help me do it. And so Mr. Miyagi was like, okay, I want you to go out and I want you to wax my car. And Daniel was like, what? And he's like, yeah, you just like this, wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. You know, some of you are laughing because you remember, right? And so he, he's like, why am I waxing a car? I want to learn karate. So then he finishes waxing the car, wax on, wax off. Now, Mr. Miyagi says, all right, now you're going to paint my fence. And he had this picket fence around his, his massive backyard. And so Daniel's over there kind of painting all over the place. He's like, no, no, that's not how you paint. I want you to paint like this, up and down, up and down. Well, Daniel finishes painting the fence, but by the end of it, he's so frustrated. He's like, man, this guy just got me doing house chores for him. I'm wanting to learn karate. And he's like, I'm waxing and I'm painting. And Mr. Miyagi says, come here, Daniel. And he walks up and he says, do wax on, wax off. And he begins to throw some, kind of some punches at him. And Daniel realizes, oh, wax on, wax off is how I block the punches. And he says, all right, now paint the fence. Same thing. He's trying to throw kicks at him or whatever punches. And Daniel's realizing, oh, I've, I've actually learned karate. I didn't even realize that I was learning karate, but I've learned karate. And if you know the rest of the movie, the crane kick, the whole deal, it's a, it's a great movie. Go watch it. Um, <laughs> But the point of what it matters for you today is this. The book of Proverbs is like learning how to wax on and wax off. It is wisdom for your life that you may not understand and realize exactly how it's all going to apply. But in the same way that Daniel was learning karate without, without realizing he was learning karate, when you learn the Proverbs of God, you're learning how to live a wise life, which will bring the blessing of God into your life. You're learning a pathway, if you will, simple principles that can be broken down and applied to your life and re can receive the blessing of God on it because of it, because it's wise, because it's wisdom. And there's so many great Proverbs and we, we won't touch on all of them in, in this particular series, but let me just kind of begin with this, Proverbs chapter 4, beginning in verse 7, where it talks about the, the, just the importance of wisdom in general. It says, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. All right, great. So it's wise to get wise. Okay, thank you, Lord. Let's keep going. Though it costs all that you have, get understanding. Cherish her, and she will exalt you. Embrace her, and she will honor you. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. Some of the ladies in the room are like, that's right, wisdom is feminine. I tell you, so it, it's for all of us, though, that we are to seek wisdom, that it'll bless us, that actually we can apply these things to our life if we're paying attention. You came to church today. You might as well pay attention and get the blessing of God on your life out of it. So here's what I wanna do today. I wanna just take two verses from Proverbs chapter three. I wanna read them to us, and then I wanna to begin to talk about how do we drill down into that? How do we actually begin to apply these, uh, these wisdom principles to our life? And let's just jump in. Wisdom, uh, Proverbs chapter three, beginning in verse one, where it says this, my son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. So what we see here, and we're gonna do this every week we're in this series, there's gonna be a, an admonition that something if you do, then there's a blessing attached to it. That if you'll, if you'll follow this, this wisdom, then there'll be a blessing that will flow out of it. So we see in this particular, verse one and verse two, the admonition is, don't forget my teaching and keep, your, keep my commands in your heart. And if we'll do that, he will prolong our life many years and bring peace and prosperity to us. Now, here's what just we have to remember about ourselves. If you're like me uh, and you like going to bookstores, uh, you've been in, into a bookstore and you realize there's like an entire section of Barnes and Noble or whatever you might go that has these self-help books. Have you, have you seen this? I mean, they're just by the millions. And these are the ways you can better your life and do these things. And so if we're not careful, when we hear this, we're like, oh, awesome. I can live longer, peace and prosperity. Like that's kind of what we focus on because we're, we're kind of conditioned by our culture to, to go after this self-help stuff. But I wanna submit to you that actually what God wants us to focus on is verse one, that we would not forget his teaching and that we would keep his commands because that is where wisdom is. And if we focus there and we give our life's attention there, 
then the blessing of having our days prolonged in peace and prosperity, that flows. That's, a, that's just the added blessing of, of having our focus in the right place. Do you follow me? Do you, do you follow what it means to, to understand what Jesus teaches and to have his commands in your heart, knowing that if you'll focus there, then the blessing flows. But when you focus on the blessing and forget what God asks us to do, then it's, it's just a roll of the dice. It's just, well, I may get lucky, I may not, and no one wants to live just kind of, you know, what are the odds gonna be? We wanna live based on the true promises of God. So as we dig into this, there's a couple questions that kind of immediately come to my mind. Number one, is this actually true? Because some of you may know, well, hey, I know somebody who actually died, died young, and as far as I knew, they, they loved God. Some, some of you may think, well, hold on. I had a great aunt and she could cuss like a sailor and she chewed tobacco. She was tough as leather and didn't love God at all. And she lived till she was 152. Like, so what, what, what's God, am I, am I really to understand this the way that God said it? And so here's what I wanna just say to us up front. These are general principles that, that relate to general promises about your life. So you have to be careful not to put your own understanding on top of the word of God, but to let the word of God um, determine your own understanding. Let me, let me tell you what I mean by this. The first time I read this scripture to begin to study, to preach it to you, you know, I thought, oh, prolong my life many years. I'm going to live till I'm 90. Like I'm going I'm to live past kind of the, the average life expectancy, but that's not what it says, is it? It just says that he will prolong your life many years. And so as I begin to study and pray and ask God, well, Lord, what does that mean? Because I know people that have, that have died young and they, they, they loved you as far as I knew. They were following your ways and, and life had either just terrible accidents, they, you know, just a, a freak accident or, or, uh, or some sort of sickness or illness or just different things that have happened. And I felt like the Lord just kind of gave me this simple way to understand it. Van, don't, don't put your understanding of what uh, prolonging your life for many years means. Just understand you're gonna live longer than you would have otherwise. So you may still... Your years, and, and kind of in a human's mind, may be short on this earth, but you're gonna live longer than you would have if you'll follow my ways, if you'll remember my teaching and keep my commands in your heart. So that's kind of a first place I'd like you, especially for those of you that are critical thinkers, I wanna, I wanna help you just to say, okay, Lord, what, allow this word to speak to you without kind of putting your expectation. How about peace and prosperity? Some of us are like, well, well hold on. Like I, I, I deal with anxiety a whole lot, but I'm, I'm at church every week and I'm, I'm spending time with God. So, so what does that mean? This means for you that there is a peace that will surpass your own understanding. That it doesn't mean that the, the struggles of this world go away. It doesn't mean that they're not moments of, of stress and anxiety and uh, even depression that we might have to journey uh, with God through those things. But you have a promise that God will give you peace if you will remember his teachings and hold his commands in your heart. How about prosperity? The, it's real quick for us to go, ooh, prosperity gospel. Van's now a TV evangelist. Like, how, what's gonna happen? Am I gonna be rich? Am I gonna win the lottery? What does that mean? No, no, it just says that there will be prosperity for you. And if you understand prosperity in the context of Genesis to Revelation, in the context of the scriptures, we know that there are some financial principles that if we'll follow, there is a blessing there. But really, prosperity is more than just your finances. It's for your emotional state, for your relationships, for your life that that you would uh, have a, a, a happy and prosperous life, peace that passes understanding, and that you would live longer than you would have normally, just in the, with everything else being equal in a fallen world where sickness happens and accidents happen, you'll live longer than you would have if you'll remember his teachings and hold on to his commands in your heart. So how are you doing with that? If you're just to be real honest, would you say, well, I'm probably, uh, I'm probably not doing that. I, you know, I, but, but there's this thing in the human conscience that immediately as I say that to you, you're like, oh, hold on, how do I, how do I win at this game then? How, how do I begin to hack at the system so that I can get away with whatever I need to get away with and then you know, honor what God needs me to honor so that I hit that sweet spot where my years will be prolonged and I can have that peace and I can have that prosperity. And, and really what we're doing is we're, we're acting just like some of the, our current day billionaires that are seeking eternal life, right? They say it's there. How do I, it's the, the pursuit of the fountain of youth. And if you've read articles, Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk and some of these different ones, they're spending millions of dollars trying to explore different sciences and things that would prolong the human life. And I'm not necessarily saying I'm, I'm against that. I'm just, I'm saying it's interesting that people are trying to figure out 
How can I live a longer? And God says all along, let me tell you how you can prolong the years of your life. Just start by remembering my teachings and keeping my commands. You know, the truth of the matter is, at some point, your body's going to die. If Jesus doesn't return first, all of our bodies are, in fact, just you're sitting right, you're dying right now, right as you sit. Like you are aging, your body is getting older, it is decaying, it's going away one of these days. But you have a spirit. You are, in fact, this is what we say, you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. Your body's going to die one day, but your spirit's going to live forever. And that's that thing on the inside of every human being that goes, well, how can I achieve that eternal life? How can I prolong my existence? And God's saying, I can prolong your life on this earth, but I can sustain you for eternity if you'll keep my teachings and you'll remember my commands. And so the invitation today is to, is to actually do that, is to lean in is to understand that God wants to meet us. Now, as we begin to do that, as we begin to kind of you know, process, you know, how does that work, and, and am I doing that well, and um, you know, how can I have this antidote to the stress, fear, and anxiety, and the depression, and all, all the things that I have, it's really simple just to, to, uh, to think of it this way. God, good things will follow God's ways. Good things will follow God's ways, and so I wanna follow God's ways. I wanna do what he has. And so the first thing that you might be thinking is, okay, commands, commands. What are, what are some of his commands? And for some of you, again, if you grew up around church or you've heard church things, you, you, kind of the first thing that comes to mind is, okay, the 10 commandments. Oh, there it is, okay. The 10 commandments. Oh, hey, I'm doing good. I never killed anybody. I'm not a thief. Uh, well, yeah, I made some private copies at work that you know, and I didn't pay for it, but, but it, that's okay, right, Lord? And he's like, mm-hmm. And then, oh, well, hold on, I didn't, I, I didn't covet what my neighbor had. I'm, all right, I can do it. And then, you th- and then you think, okay, commandment, command. Is there any other command? Oh, Jesus, Jesus, the great commandment. What Jesus said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to, to love your neighbor like, like you love yourself, and that all of the teaching, all of the law hangs on those two things. Great, that's the hack that I was looking for. Every suburbanite in the room just said the Cliff Notes version. Praise God, I don't have to learn the whole Bible. And so you begin to think, if I just do that, I can figure it out. We'll, we'll make it work. And guess what? Those things are true. Those are commands of God, and those things actually probably do get us excited because we think, well, I can, surely I can do that. Now, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not a murderer, so I'm going to be okay. I'm, I'm going to, and man, my years are going to be prolonged. But then if you read the gospels, you begin to come across some things that Jesus himself taught that are not quite as easy. And in fact, are countercultural to most of what you get uh, reinforced with in your daily lives. Things that go absolutely opposite to the direction that our world is going. And if we're not careful, and this is why we gather on Sundays like this, if we're not careful, we'll think, oh, I'm honoring God. And all the while, we're breaking what he's asked us to do, which means we're breaking his heart. And so I wonder, have you ever just paused to say, God, is there anything in my life that breaks your heart? Anything that you said, any command that you gave that that I, I wouldn't want to go against that if I knew it was your command, but, but, I'm, but I am. And so now maybe you figured it out recently or somebody said something to you and you realized, oh no, what do, I, what do I do now? Well, that's what we want to spend some time talking about today. Part of what I like to do when I preach is I like to encourage you for sure, but I like to poke your spirit a little bit and agitate you just enough to cause you to go, whoa, Am I, am I in danger here? Like, have I done something that, that would dishonor God? And the fact that, I, that you're here says to me, you want to know how to grow in your relationship with God or else you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be here on a rainy Sunday on Super Bowl Sunday, right? You'd be doing something else, but you're here. And so I want to gently agitate your spirit with a smile on my face because I love you. But I want to I wanna cause you to say, okay, uh, where might I need to get this right? Now, I don't have time to go through all the commands and the, and the things that Jesus taught, but I, I chose two big ones, two big ones that are kind of cultural things that you guys will get and understand. And one of them I kind of realized was a big deal at first Wednesday when I mentioned that it immediately caused some, uh, some feedback, and that's just uh, divorce, marriage and divorce. So many of us in this room have been touched by divorce. Either your parents were divorced or you're wanting to get divorced or you've been through a divorce yourself or maybe you've been through multiple divorces and you're wanting to follow Jesus' ways. You're wanting to remember his teaching and hold his commands in your heart so that you can have your years prolonged and you can know his peace and his prosperity. But because the world has just kind of made marriage like a, well, if you grow apart, just trade them in for another spouse. Because the world has made divorce so easy and because good and well-meaning people that love you and want to encourage you have said, yeah, if you're just not happy, then just get out of that. We've ended up in a situation where the people of God are perhaps getting suckered into the wrong way of living 
And so we're missing out on a prolonged life. We're missing out on peace and prosperity because we're swallowing the lie that the world is feeding us. The world says will make us happy. And God along saying, that's not going to make you happy. So I want to actually read to you the words of Jesus today about marriage. Uh, Matthew chapter 19 Begin in verse three, where it says this. Some Pharisees came to him to test him, and they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the creator made them male and female. And he said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but they are one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man gives his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? When Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another woman commits adultery. To which the disciples responded, and this I find this very interesting. The disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it's better not to marry. And Jesus goes on to say, yeah, perhaps so. And then he begins, he begins to say, some of you might be called to celibacy. Some of, some of you might not want to live up to the high bar that I'm setting here. Now, let me just kind of go back because there's actually two major issues here. We, there's divorce, obviously, but there's another one that's a big cultural thing that I, would just, I just need to say because it's Jesus teaching and I love you and I want to help you. So what's the first thing that I see before we even get to divorce? That he defines marriage between one man and one woman for life. What is he doing? He's going back to the creation account. He's saying, this is how it's been from the beginning. This is how my father designed it, male and female, that the two would become one flesh. He even created our biology to fit the two becoming one. And this is what marriage is. And so if I'm in the room or if I'm watching online and I know, man, I have same-sex attraction. I'm not, I'm not attracted to someone of the opposite sex. Where does that leave me? Well, here's, here's what I want you to know. It leaves you in a situation where God absolutely loves you. And you can live a healthy, God-honoring life. But God says, I don't want you to marry someone of the same sex. That's just for men and for women. That's what God has ordained. Well, hold on. The Supreme Court said it's okay. Well, hold on. The, this whole Christian denomination over here, they, they said it's okay, but that's not what Jesus said, is it? I realize that people uh, are confused about what is right and wrong. And I realize our culture is saying, well, if it's love, it's love. And if you feel that way, just go with it. But Jesus says, not me, not Cedar Crest Church. Jesus says marriage is for a male and a female. And so here's, what, here's just what I wanna say before I move on. If that's you and you struggle with same-sex attraction, I want you to know you've got a, you've got a place where you are loved and welcomed. Um, but what we're gonna encourage you to do is to pursue a life, because uh, by the way, you don't have to be married to experience the fullness of joy in life. Marriage is great, it's a blessing from God, but you can be a single person and live an absolutely fulfilled life. And so what we would say is, uh, while you're wrestling through, because everyone's got their own kind of uh, issues and temptations and things that are broken on the inside of us, and as you are kind of wrestling with this challenge of same-sex attraction, we would say, hold off on being married. Give yourself to Christian community. Surround yourself with other friends and believers. Let Cedar Crest Church be your family. Let us be your home. Let us be your relationships. But honor his teaching and his commands. And trust that he will meet you in the power of the Holy Spirit on the way. Much easier said than done, but that's the invitation of the Lord. How about those that are in a heterosexual marriage? You, you, got, you married someone of the opposite sex, but you're like, oh man, I, I'm not sure what I've done now. And, and Jesus just set this high bar. And I'm saying to you, except for, and I'm gonna take the whole scripture from Genesis to Revelation. Here's what we know about the, what the Bible says, what God's word is on marriage. Jesus mentioned one of them, except for sexual immorality, and we would say abuse or abandonment, and except for one of those three things, you're in it for life. That we, we don't look for a way out. We don't look to trade it in. We say, man, I'm super unhappy. And, and we get into community and we say, how do we get back to a healthy place? And you give yourself to Christian counseling. You give yourself to believers that will encourage you in growing in your, in your marriage, learning to die to self even more, learning to serve the other person. It will be hard work, but guess what? Proverbs says, if you'll do it because it's God's way, then your years will be prolonged and you'll have peace and prosperity. There's benefit when you follow God's ways. How about someone who's already divorced? 
who said, oh no, so have I just, is that it? Like, am I, am I, am I done? No more peace and no more prosperity? Well, here's the, the good news. There are sins of, of ignorance and there's sin of rebellion. Rebellion is when you know better and you just go against God. And those situations, I, you, you need to fall into the hands of God and say, Lord, I, I have sinned, I, I need to get right with you. Some of you though, you, you got out of a marriage before you came to God or you didn't realize or you didn't have good counsel and so, so someone just said it's the right thing to do and so you did and now you're like, well, hold on, what do I do now? Well, the great news about Jesus is you can always start today. You can always start today. It's not a, well, you didn't start right and so therefore you're just the rest of your life is a loss. Just, let's just write it off as a loss. No, you can say today, okay, God, I now get it. The truth of your teachings and your commands are that that was a mistake. I didn't have a biblical reason to get out of that divorce, but I did. And so I fall now into your mercy and grace and I ask you to forgive me and would you help me from this day forward to follow your ways. When you live like that, you're unlocking the goodness of God. Do you follow me? It's quiet in this room because this is heavy stuff. It's quiet in this room because you know that I'm poking the bear of culture. You know that I'm not just giving you what you want to hear. You know I'm giving you God's word and it's good, and it's holy, and it's right, and it is not popular today. But if you follow God's ways, and the peace and the prosperity begin to flow in your life, then you'll say, oh man, I want some more of that. Okay, uh, since I've already got you a little per perturbed, let me give you one more, just to keep it going. Just why, why not irritate you a little bit more? Promise you, I'm gonna end in a good spot, but hold, just fasten your seatbelt, put on your big boy pants, because we got one more. Uh, what if you say, okay, well, I'm, I'm married to someone of the opposite sex, and, and I'm in it to win it. I'm not getting out. Well, well hold up, there's, there's some more things Jesus said. Let's, let's try this one on for size. Matthew chapter five, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Oh Lord Jesus, help this pastor that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? Now, he's not talking about the IRS. He's, he's talking about these, these scoundrels that were collecting taxes for Rome, and they were robbing their own people. These were, tax collectors were Jews that were robbing their neighbor. They were saying, you owe this to Rome, and you, I'm going to take even more from you with this soldier standing next to me so that I can pad my own pocket. These were people that you would have hated their guts. Way worse than anything you've experienced in your neighborhood. I promise, this is way beyond get off my lawn. This is way beyond the HOA sent you a letter because the grass wasn't mowed. This is, they robbed you, okay? And Jesus says, Jesus says, I want you to love them. I want you to love your enemies and I want you to pray for those who persecute you. Even the sinners, even the people that are broken are, get along with people that are nice to them. And he raises the bar of what it means to be a Christian. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm always, again, we're all suburbanites, so I'm always looking for the loophole, right? I'm like, okay, pray for my, pray, you love them, pray for my, those that persecute. Lord, can I pray that they will lose control of their bowels today in Jesus' name? <laughs> and embarrass, you know, right? Like, come on, now, this, is, this is human existence. This is not easy. This is, come, they did me wrong. But if you begin to understand what, why Jesus would say something like this, then you go, oh, there's the wisdom. Here's what Jesus knows about you and me. When we hold on to unforgiveness or bitterness or anger, you've heard this before, it's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. You are literally rotting yourself from the inside out. Jesus knows not only will your days not be prolonged, but you will shorten your life with high blood pressure and all the crazy things that go on in us biologically when we hold on to unforgiveness and bitterness. And so Jesus says, I want you to love your enemies and I want you to pray for those who persecute you. In other words, I want you to get to a place where you can release that and give it to me and let me be the one who judges between right and wrong. He's a just God. He will deal with those that are in the wrong, but he says to you and to me to not let that be a burden on our heart. So right now, just in your own world, is there somebody who just not only gets on your nerves, but man, they, they, they become an enemy. Do you have it within you to say, Lord, I will pray for them today. I will release them today to you. I will trust your ways over my own ways and in doing so, encounter the goodness of God. The big question is this, will we follow God's ways even when we don't feel like it? It's all about how we feel today, isn't it? Well, I feel attracted to this person. Well, I feel like there's somebody better out there. Well, I feel like they've been wrong to me and so I'm just gonna give it right. In fact, I'm gonna give it double back, right? That's how we feel 
But will we follow the way that we feel or will we follow God's ways? God says, God, if you'll remember my teaching and keep my commands, you will prolong your life. In other words, you're gonna live longer than you would have. You're gonna have supernatural peace and you're gonna have supernatural prosperity. So it all boils down to, do you believe that or not? Do you take God at his word? I'm not asking you to take me at my word. I'm just merely presenting the word of God and saying, do you, do you trust that? And some of you are like, well, I don't know. And here's what I would say to you. For 2,000 years, followers of Jesus from every socioeconomic background, every gender, every skin color, every nation, every tribe, every tongue, that have put their trust in Jesus and his word have never been let down. If people were being let down left and right, there wouldn't be a church. But the greatest movement the world has ever known is based on a man named Jesus who went to the cross and paid a price for you and me that we couldn't pay. He was killed for it. They put him in an empty tomb and three days later, he was alive. He appeared to over 500 people on 11 different occasions. Thomas, one of his own, doubted that he was alive, saw him in person and Jesus said, come and put your hands in my hands, put your hand on my side. He's alive and for 2,000 years has been changing lives and bringing that supernatural peace that overcame the grave and bringing that supernatural prosperity and expanding of our lives, not just in this world, but for eternity because of the goodness of who he is. And you're invited to follow that God if you would want to. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. But here's the thing, you can't do that on your own. Do you know that? You know that you might be sitting here going, okay, great, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give this a try. I, I'm, gonna give the, I'm gonna test drive this car right here. We're gonna begin to try to trust God, but you're gonna run out of your own strength. So what do you do? Like if, if we could do it in our own strength, Jesus didn't have to go to the cross. Do you understand what I'm saying? He had to come to the cross because we could not do it. We couldn't figure it out. We couldn't work our way to God. There wasn't enough animals to kill in the sacrificial system that they had before that. God himself sent his son and that anyone who ever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. And this is what Jesus, the one who gave his life for you and me said in John 14. If you love me, keep my commands. Jesus, we love you and we wanna keep your commands but we, we fall short, so what do we do? He said, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. When you step into relationship with Jesus, if you say, man, I, I wanna follow the wisdom of God. I, I want my years prolonged. I want the peace and prosperity of heaven on my life. How do I do that? You start by surrendering. God, my life is not my own. I trust your ways. I don't see how I'm gonna get through some of the challenges that I have. I, ca I can't do it in my own strength. So I surrender to you, God, and then God says, Thank you for being wise. Now I give you the spirit of truth. That's the Holy Spirit. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the spirit of God. Now comes to live on the inside of you. And now when you begin to work on your marriage, the power of God comes alive. When you begin to deal just with your own thoughts and attractions and, and places of, well, this person, that person, who, and God says, power of God, come and help me. Where, I'm, where I feel I'm being pulled away from your commands, God, would you speak to me, your heart for me? Where I'm just, man, so angry at this person that stole this business job from me or, or did me wrong or stabbed me in my back or has gossiped about me at work or at school or whatever, and I just, man, I, I would love to see that person wiped out from the face of it. I'd love you just go Old Testament on them. Just kind of take them out, Heavenly Father. And you're saying, but man, that's killing me, God. I'm, I'm just walking around a bitter person. I don't want to be like that. You say, Holy Spirit, I surrender. Would you come and pour your love into me? Would you make me aware of how much I had broken your heart and yet you poured out forgiveness on me and then enable me to trust you with this person? That is the secret and the power to following Jesus and to having his commands and his teachings rule your heart so that the blessings that follow that will be evident in your life. So here's like what I'd like to do to close our service today. There may just be one person in the room that says, you know, I, I don't have peace and prosperity in my life. I, there's a lot of brokenness in my life. And you, you just, you recognize today, I, I'm not surrendered to God. I need to surrender to him 
And I need to invite his Holy Spirit into my life. For that one person that's in the room that may wanna do that, would you just bow your heads and close your eyes with me? I'm not gonna embarrass anybody, but I wanna pray for anybody in the room that says, I need that. So if that's you, without hesitation, would you just raise your hand right where you are, just say, I need Jesus in my life. Thank you, thank you, thank you. There's hands up all over the room. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? I see you in the back. Thank you, guys. Over here, thank you, God. Okay, let's pray together. Lord, we look to you. God, thank you that... We, when we surrender, there is grace that flows. There is forgiveness that flows. There's the power and the gift of the Holy Spirit that, that flows. All we've got to do is surrender. So right now, for my friends that are saying, I, I give up, God. I, I've tried to do it on my own, but I can't. Lord, I pray that you would come. I pray that you would meet my friends right where they are, where they are surrendering, maybe for the first time, perhaps surrendering again. And Lord, would you fill them with the Holy Spirit? We thank you for the cross. We thank you for what you want on the cross for us. And now, Lord, we ask for the power to heaven to come and give us what only you can give us. God, I pray that my friends would be blessed today to walk with you and the power of knowing your goodness in their life. It's all about you today, Lord Jesus. We love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand with me? Let's sing this chorus together.